Okie dokie, welcome everybody. It is now 11.30, so we shall get going just whilst the camera decides where it wants to point slightly. Um, both sessions in this hour on, are on the wildcard theme of the conference. And for the first 30 minutes, we have Hui Ying Wong with the development of learners' digital practice in a learning network. This will be a 25 minute presentation followed by around five minutes for some very quick and speedy questions. I will hand over now. It could be three hours if I end up talking theories and get too excited. So, but um, I'll try try not to do that. Um, so, thanks very much. Um, I'm Puyin. I am a PhD student uh, from the Education Research Department at Lancaster University. I'm also a digital learning producer at UAL and a trustee of Alt. Um, but today, I'm talking to you as a researcher. Um, I'm talking a, uh, a research project I did about a year ago on exactly the title as our chair just um, told you. And um, for some bizarre reason, my team wanted to have a meeting with me right now, which is not going to happen. Um, um, but before I uh, go into the, 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 the actual um, research, I just wanted to explain what I mean by digital practice. Um, I mean digital practice by including digital capability, digital literacy, digital skills. Um, so the reason why I chose to use a more slightly more generic term is because I was inspired by a blog post right, uh, written by Dr. Donna Lanko. She's here today and tomorrow. So if you disagree with what I'm about to say, take it up with her, not with me. Um, <laughs> uh, we shouldn't be um, describing people with such binary terms because the opposite of capability is incapability. The opposite of literacy is Ill illiteracy. So we should really be looking at someone's development from a more holistic uh, perspective, hence the term digital practice. Um, but if I use digital practice capabilities and literacy interchangeably in this presentation, it's because I've forgotten <laughs> some of the things I've just said. Um, so um, before I talk about the actual practice, there will be some towards the end of the presentation. Um, it wouldn't be a research project without some theories. And um, this is where you're going to be locked in this room until five o'clock until I've explained to you what threshold concept is. If you don't understand what it is, no, you're not leaving this room. That is a guarantee. I'm joking. Uh, you'd be allowed to go for lunch at some point. Four o'clock. Sound good? Um, so uh, in this, um, how do I change the slide on the other one? Yeah, so I've tried to combine two theories in this um, study. The first one is threshold concept. Um, to put it in a very simplistic way, threshold concept is about how we learn, how we realize the fact that we're learning, we're processing information, perhaps somehow subconsciously, rather than sitting in a classroom being forced that information. Um, so it's kind of like a, it's, it's meta learning. If you, if you know what that is, it's basically just how you process information. At the end of it, you realize, actually, I can accurately describe what I've learned in, in my own way rather than repeating what my teacher has taught me. So there are five distinctive characteristics. Um, some people would argue there are six, there are eight, but I've gone for the classic route because I want to keep it simple and less thing to explain is always good for me. Um, so just very quickly to go through them, uh, transformative is a change in our understanding of a subject. So uh, as you go through learning a process or a subject, you, your views might change. And every time you change your view about something, that's a transformative threshold concept experience. Um, irreversible, very simply, once something's learned, your view of that something's always going gonna, gonna to change forever. So, for example, learning how to ride a bike. Once you've learned how to ride a bike, you're never going to forget. And you're always going to look at a bicycle differently. Um, Integrity is um, uh, pockets of isolated knowledge that you might have learned throughout your life. They make sense independently, but they don't quite make sense as a connected sort of piece. And if you go through that integrative um, uh, uh, threshold concept experience, this is where things begin to connect. Um, bounded or boundedness is um, where you start to understand the same word or terminology, have different meanings in different contexts. So discipline specific knowledge terminology might mean something in engineering, but it might mean something else in everyday life. And I can't think of an example. I have one in my paper. I'm happy to share with you guys, but I just can't, can't remember what I actually wrote. Um, at least I'm being honest, right? Um, the last one is troublesome knowledge, um, new, new perspective, new knowledge of something you already know 
might be troublesome. If I, if you always thought, let's say an orange is sweet, but I'm telling you today an orange is sour, you might be like, well, actually it's not. I'm going to disagree with you. You might be troubled by it. But at the end of the day, you have to understand um, different views. And by the end of the process, you have to make up your own mind. Is an orange sweet or sour or a bit of both? It's for you to decide, but it's the process of being troubled by different perspectives. That's kind of quite common experience people people go through in, in, in the sort of stressful concept um, literature. Um, all these experiences could be had independently or together or in whichever order through a liminal space or liminality, um, which basically is a space where you enter, you get confused, you might get lost, but hopefully by the end of the process, you come out going through that aha moment, which is quite a common thing that people refer in any fresh concept literature. It's the rite of passage you have to go through from not knowing something to knowing something. So that that's briefly what fresh concept is. Um, I don't expect you to understand because after five years of learning this thing, I still don't fully understand what it is. But, you know, um, anyway, so the next theory is a little bit easier to explain. That's the networked learning theory. That is not to be confused with community of practice or connected with some or connected learning. It's very different. They're very similar, but very different with one distinctive feature of networked learning theory. In networked learning community, the people have to be connected via some sort of technology. So the most famous example of a networked learning community is actually academic Twitter or what's left of it. Um, because people connect through a common technology. So your local knitting club is unlikely to be a network learning community. That is a community of practice. So that's the difference. And um, uh, I'm going to skip the pattern of relationship because that's obvious. You know, once you, you know, um, have been in a group for a while, you, you have sort of, you know, your, your preferred people you want to talk to. That's just common human nature. Uh, a lot of um, network learning scholars believe in uh, uh, social justice in the network learning community. So there shouldn't be any leader, there shouldn't be any followers, everybody should be allowed to have um, their fair share of their participation and communication and whatever engagement in that group. So no one should um, take over, it should just be everyone, you know, happily getting along. So that's what it is. And it's, at this point, you might wonder, well, how did the two theories connect? It is very simple. And I don't know why I put the next slide as my actual research question, but if anyone seems to that that's what it is. How can special concept be realized in a peer mainly online learning environment that can enhance the individual learners digital practice? Don't ever have a research question this long. Have one that you can say in one breath, which I couldn't. Um, but it's basically um, my theoretical assumption of the two uh, theory is that if you are in a network learning community, I'm talking about online community, if you talk to your peers, if you engage with them, I think it's a, perhaps subconsciously, it's a better way of actually learning. And what I mean by learning is the definition and threshold concept. So it's your engagement, your discussion with your peers, maybe after a class, maybe, you know, after a seminar, the thing you've been taught, you might not understand fully what it is, but it's in the kind of group discussions afterward, the kind of casual discussion that goes on at the background. That's how you um, potentially realize you're actually learning that thing that is not being forced upon you. So that, that's how I see the two theories connect. Um, I'm hoping that by uh, creating a network learning community, um, peers within the network could kind of inspire each other to experience the special um, concept characteristic, as I described, I've been told in the last conference, I'm, a lot, I'm not allowed to say threshold concept experiences because that's wrong. Don't ask me why, I've just been told that, but I disagree. And that was a threshold concept conference. So they're right, I'm wrong, whatever. Um, so in order to prove my assumption that two theories connect, I've gone for um, an experiment, if you like, and I've used the um, design-based research tradition. So design-based research, uh, sorry, design-based research methodology. And with that, it's a very prescriptive methodology. You have to come up with an intervention, an experiment, and you have to come up with a set of intended outcomes. And you have to plan your intervention down to the T and you have to prove yourself right or wrong or somewhere in between. So this is my conjun 
oh, sorry, two computers, confusing. This is my conjunction map. Um, so as you can see, the purple bits are um, what my intervention is in the beginning. That is a four week online testing course, which I'll explain in more detail in a minute. And the intended outcome is that people who have experienced that four weeks course should develop their digital practice. And the green bits are the kind of nitty gritty details down to the, you know, the technology and the inter uh, interaction and how I predicted that people would inter interact with each other. I don't control how people uh, uh, interact in the, in the um, intervention on the course, but I predicted some of the behavior. Um, so this is the complicated version, the actual full version. And this is the um, simplified version. As I said, it's a four weeks online course. Uh, so try to keep it simple and flexible. Uh, it's mostly asynchronous discussion because when you think about our daily communication now online, it's a lot of asynchronous communication, DMs and Twitter and uh, WhatsApp and what have you, more so than verbal communications. I try and kind of replicate that. And there has been research saying that um, students sometimes prefer the kind of asynchronous communication because it's less here and now. So it gives them time to think and reflect before they have to respond. So I'm trying, I'm trying to mimic that. And also the flexibility is important um, for my participants as much as it is in real life. Um, so... Um, the, the first column is basically just a, a summary of the weekly um, activities. The middle columns is um, what I expect the behavior, the interaction would be. And the third columns are the um, four areas of digital practice I expected everyone to have developed at the end of the course. Um, those are taken from the GIST digital capability framework. I'm not so interested in the some of the things about the framework talking about, you know, learning different digital skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm more interested in the kind of, as I said, holistic um, uh, elements of how someone develops as a, as a person, I suppose, in some ways. So um, just going to quickly tell you, show you what the actual practice is, and we're going to quickly look at the results. Um, four weeks courses, as I said, I opened a university online. That's based on a platform called Telus Elevate, but I need to declare that the that the research has no commercial relationship with Talus. They basically just gave me a whole bunch of license and say, have fun, no string attached. So I'm not sponsored by them anyway, so from. Um, so this is just basically a hub for the participant to, like a VLE, like a Moodle site, people somewhere to, to get the links. Um, just a bit nicer than emailing people back and forth. Um, this is what the interface looked like. Um, Basically, it's a bit like a like a like a more colorful version than a, a, of a of a Google document. You highlight bits of um, things that you want to discuss of an of an article or of a video, and then you have a discussion. That's that's basically what it is. Um, it's just a more kind of interactive way to discuss things than using a Google doc or using a forum, and everything is in the same space. Um, so. What I haven't talked about is the um, sample size so important in any research. If I told you two people talk about in this course, you might think, well, your result is a lot of nonsense because they're two people's opinions. But if I told you I had 23 people, the project then becomes more believable because it's a bigger sample size. Um, so 23 high education professional uh, who either work in the digital world or who has an investor interest in digital talk part. Um, it was a deliberate decision to not to ask actual students because I needed people who has already had the foundation of understanding digital in a, to be able to go through a very concentrated version of what a real life um, course might be, a real life kind of experience might be, because four weeks is no time. So I needed people to be able to just get in there and scrutinize the activities very quickly. Um, so um, the data I got were obviously the interactions with the people, the discussion that they had throughout the weeks. Um, and also um, there were at certain points, the four weeks, there were um, focus group questions. I asked them again, asynchronous question discussion uh, where they respond, they responded. And then there were also um, interviews with eight selected participants, which are like more focused interview to ask them more details about the responses, because I acknowledge that there's only so much you can write um, in a message. So sometimes you do have to revert back to the kind of verbal one-to-one -one conversation. So that's why there's uh, multiple layers of different um, data collection. So uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so just gonna quickly look at the findings. Um, 
we see this graph again. I've now tried to connect the activity to the interaction to the um, what I predicted to be the improved digital practice. Um, so communication and participation pretty much happened throughout the week as expected, uh, with the exception of week four, which was more just self-reflection and people just reflecting on their experiences till they kind of, I suppose, operated more in silos than as, as a group. Um, communication and participation has proven to be transformative for a lot of people because only through discussion they realize Actually, I haven't, I haven't thought about something in a different way. You're right, or I'm wrong, or you're wrong, I'm right. So this discussion really helped people to kind of um, develop multiple areas of the digital practice, assuming different roles. Maybe this minute I'm a teacher, the next minute I'm a, I'm a learner in the same conversation, but they are teaching people, they're teaching each other different things. And through that, obviously, you develop your critical voice because, you know, it takes a certain... Um, courage to speak up, which is why sometimes in group discussions, people don't speak. It's not because they're stupid, it's just because they haven't got the courage. Um, so moving on to um, collaboration and knowledge contribution mainly happened um, during the main bit of the course, the actual discussions. Um, I should probably mention, which I forgot, the um, discussions were mainly around various topics in higher education because I had to find a common ground for all the participants. So uh, in a real life situation, it could be discussion of some other topics. I just had to find something for them to discuss that they both could understand. So in your respective discipline, it could be microbiology, it could be petting cats, it could be whatever that could be. Yeah. Um, so collaboration knowledge contribution mainly happened in the middle bit of the course, as I said. Um, the troublesome knowledge, the troublesome experience was particularly apparent because as you get into discussion, you realize, again, the conflicting views started to emerge, particularly at the later part of the course, when people kind of got to know each other a little bit better. They realized that actually I can be a bit brave, I can voice my opinion stronger. Uh, there was one example, uh, one participant categorically refused to uh, engage in one particular discussion of an article written by her ex-boss, because they really don't get on. There's nothing, there's nothing more to it other than they just don't get on. And she made her feelings very clear, highlighting her name to say, I hate this person, I'm not going to take part this week or something like that. And it got other people interested, thinking, well, am I going to take you, you, what you said, as face value? That this person is a bad writer, what she's written is not valid, or am I going to actually scrutinize that content even more to make my own judgment? So there was kind of discussion about whether or not they should read the article I prescribed rather than the actual article, which was quite interesting. But that's where the troublesome knowledge, the troublesome experience comes in. You have to make your own mind. New views that come into your, your view, are you going to accept them or not? And that 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 you know that happens quite a lot in online spaces where there's so much noises, you know, about AI, for example. There's so many people, you know, saying things. Which one are you going to believe? You have to make up your own mind. Um, so very, very quickly, running out of time. I do apologize. Um, so we, um, the, the next interaction I expect would, was the challenging uh, challenge previously understood knowledge. Um, it sort of happened again throughout the course, um, except for week one where there was ice-breaking exercise. It was just completely, just have fun. I think I did, what did I did? Um, choose your Pokemons and just tell people why you think you're Pikachu or one of the other 50 Pokemons. I have no idea, but I just, you know. Not a fan of Pokemon. I just thought there's enough characters for people to choose from. Um, and um, one thing that really really stands out is um, how people, as as, as they got comfortable, how people kind of like bring in additional resources to support their view. So they're not just saying, "Oh, well, I agree with this article. I agree with this resource." And they don't, they're not just saying about their view, they're also bringing in other evidence to support themselves, which is quite interesting because then the knowledge bank becomes bigger and bigger. It's not just what I prescribe, it's other people bringing in knowledges, uh, other knowledge. So you become each other's teachers. And this is where I think the, 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 the a learning network becomes very interesting when you are measuring people's special concept experience because 
you just don't know what people end up learning because they end up they end up learning far more than what me perhaps as a teacher in this in this regard would expect. Um, so there's that. And then last but not least, and then I promise I will shut up. Um, uh, support and relationship building, um, as I mentioned, you know, pattern relationship happens in any network. Um, this is no exception. Um, I think one of the, the most um, obvious thing that happened, and perhaps no surprise to you guys, is that um, there were a lot of um, in-groups, as it were, um, a participant were really, really clear to say, well, I actually ended up only wanting to talk to these people, but not those people, because their views agree with mine more so than those people. And it's, it, it's a problem, but it, I think, I think the, the, the one thing that stood out from this experiment is that, is that the people are, are aware of, of that. They are aware of the fact that they are kind of leaning towards particular people. So I, I, I think it's the awareness that, that makes it interesting. They're aware of this as a problem. This is a double-edged sword. And they're willing to kind of adapt their attitude accordingly, which is why I linked it to the um, develop different identities and also the new interpretation of knowledge, because it's the awareness that, 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 that matters. If you're not aware that you're only wanting to listen to one set of opinions, then that's, what, that's where the problem is. But, but it wasn't the case in this particular um, um, case. So just to conclude, this is the, the overall map of the four um, individual maps you've seen. You can see it's messy, it's meant to be all over the place. Um, and that's what makes learning interesting. And that's what makes developing digital practice. It shouldn't be a capability thing. We shouldn't say, have you learned A, B, and C? We should really look at the overall thing. Have you developed as a whole? And often when you look back, not in four weeks, when you, you know, when you look back in the last few years, you realize actually I've come a long way, um, developed all these things. I don't know how, but I have. And, with, and this is why I wanted this project to kind of potentially at the beginning of a development of some sort of framework to offer people something to measure how they learn. And this is just the beginning. So maybe I'll, I'll come back next year and, and, and a version two, I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll stop because, you know, we're severely out of time, but thanks very much. And if you want to in the slide and the references are um, in that link, if anybody wants to read the actual paper, just 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 let me know. It's not published, so I can't, you know, because I want to publish, so I, so I can't post it online because once I've done it, it becomes a bit tricky. So if anybody wants to read, I can privately send it to you. So thank you. So thank you for that very interesting talk. We now have a short eight minutes or so for any questions. Should there be any in the room, please just raise your hand or we can stare awkwardly at each other for just a small moment. Go I can keep it. talking. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, that was cracking. Um, I thought you said that was crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now James and I know each other. James and I know each other, so it's fine. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything rude. Um, so uh, coming back to your... Um, the people that you had in this study, you said that they were um, effectively like uh, professionals or used to using these types of technologies rather than students, which I'm assuming you're talking about like undergrad or- Any you know, student. Any. So if, if you are uh, a lecturer, then your student would be actual student. For me, my student would be academic. So it, you know, it depends. Okay. So if you um, had more than a month, uh, maybe like three months, would that change your view on who you would have selected? Yes. If I had three months or six months, ideally a year to run a module. Um, in fact, this could really be applied to any modules anybody run. You just have to apply. You just have to kind of almost like engineer the kind of network to learning community and really measure the threshold concept experience quite artificially. 
Um, but because, uh, you know, I didn't have luxury at the time, I had to do the whole project from planning to finish the writing in about five months time. So I didn't have the luxury of, of actually running an actual course. And that would be ideal. If anyone wants to let me run this on their program, please just let me know. I'll do it for free and we can share the credits, <laughs> you know. So, yes, yes, I would. Because then I would have time to explain to the people what digital practice is and I, you know just just yeah, I have more time to 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 do the prep work with the people so yeah any other questions in the room yes of course thank you and um, that was really good thank you I really enjoyed that thank, thank you. you I was just wondering you mentioned about it would be good if you'd had longer so have you got any plans for kind of further research to kind of go but I was just thinking about going back to things and maybe looking at relationships that be informed or or because you've got everything in there haven't you I mean it could be such a big project if you really I, I do I do I do have the plan as like I said um uh you know um the this this thing here is really a stage one of what I well, my ambition would be in 20 years time, I'll be the famous researcher who connect the two theories together. Sorry to shout, but I do get excited about trying to connect the two theories together because one is about individual learning. One is about how we learn from each other. There's an obvious connection and it doesn't even have to be digital. You can apply it to any, any subject. It doesn't matter. Um, so I, I do want to do further work, but it's a case of, um, sometimes I think the difficulty with doing educational research is that your job doesn't really allow you to, the, the time or the agency or the resource, because I'm, a, I'm a, a learning designer. I just don't run any courses. I don't have students. I could naturally say, guys, this year we're teaching as normal, but, you know, I have to kind of almost beg my academic colleagues to say, can I? And most of the time they don't want you to play with their students, this kind of thing where you're a bit dodgy. Well, no. But so, so yes, the, I would like to, but whether or not I can, I don't know. I can only keep trying. So, if you think about the, um, the keynote that we just had with the student panel, you know, on it, and a lot of the things yeah. that you were saying, and it picks up on the work that you're doing, and it's some of the stuff that they were saying is not new. We we were kind of all kind of grumble about these things. Yeah. So you don't necessarily get the opportunity to embed it. So no. Yeah, so as I said, if anyone wants to let me have a, you know, have a partnership with their on their courses, please just let me know. I mean, I mean, it, it'd be really good to apply this in a real life situation, because uh, the whole thing about the network learning theory is is to invent some sort of in, um, uh, 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 experiment, and you, you you almost like a lab experiment, and then you apply that to real life situation. In fact, the PhD I'm doing at Lancaster um, some 15, 16 years ago, when the network learning theory was created. Cohort one was the experiment. And 16 years later, the, the, the course is still running. So it, it it works. So yeah. So just for the people at home, that last comment was about linking this session to the keynote uh, and developing that going forward. We probably have time for like the most speediest question. The longest. <laughs> the longest answer. About your data, tell us tell us about your uh, data collection. Did you use VLE? What you know? How did you use your data? I wasn't expecting such a um, transformative presentation. I just read the title. I thought oh, I was expecting something boring, but wow. <laughs> oh, thank so, you. Really interesting. Really. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> no, no, no. But fantastic. It's it, it's, it's a backhanded compliment. Um. So as as as. as as I said, the, the, the whole um, uh, experiment experiment was done on Teller's Elevate, which is a social annotation uh, uh, platform. Um, and the uh, the data collection was pretty manual. I had to basically copy and paste all the messages and put them on um, LST, Atlas TI, which is a um, coding software. So I kind of did it quite manually because um, I wasn't working on behalf of an institution. I was doing it as a student. And Talis says it's really generous to give me a bunch of licenses, I think 50 they gave me to play with. Um, so I just thought, you know what, suck it up and just do it manually. Um, I'd like some automated sort of like data analysis software to help, but you know, I did it with no budget. So, you know, I'm also asking for budget. I'd rather be independent than, you know, which is why I said to Talis quite clearly, if you give me the licenses, 
I will not promote you. I will not even put your logo. I mean, there's no, you know, I don't even have to mention them. All they asked for was, can you give us an hour of your time afterward to tell us um, how we can improve the platform? That was the only condition. So, yeah. Thank you for that. I think one more last round of applause for those wonderful answers.